good evening to all colleagues in Seoul, in the Philippines, and uh, the rest of Asia. Uh, good evening, uh, good morning to our colleagues in the United States, in Europe, and uh, Latin America. First of all, I would like to thank uh, JC's Medical for giving me this opportunity to deliver a lecture uh, in this webinar. And the title of the talk, I'm basically sharing my experience on best practices and the use of the Q-switch and the YAG laser on facial hyperpigmentation. So in the next 20 minutes, I'll discuss uh, pre-laser evaluation before using the pigment laser Q-switched and the YAG, the clinical applications, other promising um, clinical indications, and aesthetic uses, aims of future research, side effects, and um, precautions. So for the pre-laser evaluation, we need to take a very good history we need to do a complete physical examination. We should know the contraindications, both absolute and relative um, contraindications, before using the Q-switch and the YAG. And of course, we have to elicit if the patient is taking any other um, medications which um, might aggravate the hyperpigmentation. For example, um, if the patient is uh, taking a, pho a photosensitive or a phototoxic uh, drug. And then we come up with a uh, diagnosis. And now we are very lucky to have gadgets like the dermatoscope and an examiner, which determines the melanin index for the degree of um, pigmentation. And then after that, we choose the right wavelength. Uh, we should choose whether um, we will use the 5 feet to nanometer uh, wavelength for epidermal lesions or the 1064 nanometer wavelength for dermal lesions. And then most important, we need to uh, secure an informed consent and consent also for taking photographs. So these are the main causes of facial hyperpigmentation and pigmented lesions in type four pigmented skin. And when I talk about type four pigmented skin, I'm referring to Asian skin, Middle Eastern skin, or Latino skin. So on the malar area, the most common pigmented lesion is melasma. It also may extend to the mandibular area. And on the same spot, we occasionally see cases of um, ochronosis, which is paradoxical hyperpigmentation due to the use of uh, products containing a hydroquinone. On the zygomatic area, um, this is the most common location for what is known as abnorm or acquired bilateral nevus of otter like macules. In the Indian population, infraorbital or periorbital pigmentation is um, fairly common. On the forehead, we may see uh, pigmentation, and this may, this may be related to pigmented contact dermatitis or uh, contact dermatitis in the cosmetics. We call this um, real melanosis. Another differential diagnosis would be frictional melanosis in some patients who usually wear hats. And a very important differential diagnosis is lichen planus pigmentosus, which um, we see in Indians, in Latinos. We have a few cases also in the Philippines. And it is usually a um, brownish to grayish black pigmentation on the forehead. And this may be associated with a frontal fibrosing um, alopecia. So these are the absolute um, contraindications, photosensitivity, active infection, the presence of vitiligo, malignancy, or pregnancy. Relative contraindications are cuts and abrasions and the tendency to form keloids. And of course, we have to know whether the patient is taking any of the photo um, sensitizing medications such as amiodarone, minocycline, anticonvulsants, uh, etc. And then we usually formulate or come up with a diagnosis. And the most common uh, lesions which are present in the epidermis in which the Q-switched and the YAG um, can target or can, uh, can, be, can, can give a therapeutic benefit would be Lantigenes, ephilids, junctional nevi, cafe au lait macules, uh, nebus pilus. Lesions in the dermis, 
include uh, tattoos, nevus of otter. We acquired bilateral nevus of otter like macules, uh, medication induced pigmentation, especially in patients taking uh, minocycline for a long period of time, for example, for acne or for Hansen's disease exogenous orchinosis, and reals or pigmented contact dermatitis, and lesions which in which the pathology is located both in the epidermis and the dermis are the following, melasma, and most important is post-inflammatory uh, hyperpigmentation. However, there are conditions which we call facial hyperpigmentation of unknown etiology, and we have to be very careful with this. Um, diseases because most of the time they don't respond to skin lightening agents or um, pigment lasers. And this includes like in planus uh, pigmentosus or idiopathic eruptive macular pigmentation, which in some cases this is also known as um, ashy uh, dermatitis. So now we are very lucky to have gadgets which helps us to make a definite diagnosis whether lesions or skin lesions or pigmented lesions are located in the epidermis or the dermis. If it's, if the color is brown, we're usually dealing with um, epidermal lesions. So for example, in the last month, we see a reticulate brown uh, pigmentation. In ochronosis, we see reddish brown uh, vermiculate uh, structures which obliterate follicular openings. So Abnum is very common among Asians in Filipinos, Koreans, and Chinese. However, if we use uh, dermoscopy, it doesn't show brown macules. Instead, uh, dermoscopy shows uh, bluish gray or grayish brown macules and patches. And for lichen planus pigmentosus, we see gray dots and we call the finding uh, peppering. And this corresponds to the melanophages uh, that we see if we do a biopsy. And lichen planus pigmentosus may also present with reticulated white lines, brownish gray pigments, and uh, window vessels. And we have to exercise caution because some of the pigmented lesions are actually pre-malignant or malignant. Take this case, for example, of a 71-year-old male with a pigmented patch on the right cheek and turned out to be a lentigo malignant melanoma um, or lentigo maligna because of the dermoscopic findings of rhomboidal structures with asymmetric follicular openings, peppering, and of course, this was confirmed by a skin biopsy. So for unusual cases, it is mandatory to do a biopsy, even if we're dealing with uh, lesions on the face. So this is an, just an example of a reflectance photometer. It determines melanin index. The melanin index may range from a value of 16 to 62 uh, units in brown skin. Uh, this is very useful in clinical practice, especially when we want to evaluate response to treatment. And if there is reduction in melanocyte index values during follow-ups, that means the patient is improving. If there is no change in the melanocyte index, for example, in our patients with melasma, then most probably our interventions are not uh, working. So now we choose the right wavelength. And just to show you the mechanism of action of all the pigment lasers, the mechanism of action is always selective photothermolysis. And our target chromophore is uh, eumelanin. So the pigment laser exerts a photomechanical effect. And there's a rapid rise in temperature, a very high, more than 900 degrees Celsius. It causes fracture of the melanosomes. And eventually, these fragments are eaten up by melanophages and it is cleared out in our system. So what is the difference between using the 5P2 nanometer wavelength, the shorter wavelength, versus the 1064 wavelength? So the 5 3 2 nanometer is used basically for epidermal lesions or lesions that are present in the epidermis. It also targets red pigments. So it is used for red uh, tattoos. In contradistinction, the longer wavelengths, the 1064 uh, nanometer, takes care of dermal lesions. So for example, we're dealing with deeper pigments such as tattoo, melanophages, 
we use the 1064 nanometer wavelength. It is also safer for darker skin. So it is very important to decipher at first before using your um, pigment laser which wavelength uh, should be used. So for example, we're dealing with solar lentigo. We all know that the pigments or the granocytes are located at the tips of the retina ridges. Then we should use 532 to destroy the lesion. However, if we're dealing with abnum or nevus of otta, we know that on histopathology, the pigments are located um, not in the epidermis, but in the upper dermis, extending to the lower dermis. So we should use the 1064 uh, nanometer uh, wavelength. And of course, it is very important to uh, secure informed consent for uh, medical photography. All right, so what are the present clinical applications of the Q-switch and the YAG laser? So again, I'm showing these slides, epidermal lesions, dermal lesions, and lesions that involve both the epidermis and the dermis. So I start with lentigenes. So the Q-switch and the YAG is known to be highly effective for lentigenes, and we use the 5P2 uh, nanometers. So this is one of my patients, and just to show you, uh, the lesion at baseline and our therapeutic endpoint is blanching. These are the parameters that I use. Usually 1.5 to 2 joules per centimeter squared. So usually start with 1.5 uh, joules per centimeter squared, do a test shot, observe for five minutes, and then if there is no um, endpoint, then I increase the fluence to 1.6, 1.7, 1.8 until you have the desired um, therapeutic endpoint, which is blanching. And then after two weeks, we'll see that there is a 50% reduction in pigment. And after the uh, one month after the second session, there is almost complete resolution of the pigment, pigmented lesion with a residual um, erythema. This is just uh, to show you if we use the dermoscope in the evaluation of um, the therapeutic endpoint. And after uh, treatment, so this is at baseline where you see the pigmented lesion. There is uniform blanching achieved immediately after the session. And then after two weeks, there's residual erythema with a complete disappearance of the pigment. The affiliates or freckles are also known to respond well to the Q-switch lasers. But Please note that we use a lower fluence of 1.2 to 1.5 joules per centimeter squared in skin prototype 4. So this is just an example of a younger patient with uh, freckles. So we use the 5T2 nanometer wavelength at 1 joules per 1 joule per centimeter squared and a spot size of uh, 3 to 4 millimeters. This is another example at baseline and the following images are images on dermoscopy. Uh, we see a, a reticulate brown um, asymmetric pigmented uh, macule. And immediately after the procedure, we see blanching and leukotrichia. So that means uh, we have successfully delivered um, the proper fluence uh, in this case. However, in my practice, because I sometimes use dermoscopy to check the uniformity of blanching. So take this case, for example, in the same patient, when I use a single pulse, that means a single shot, there is only suboptimal or incomplete uh, blanching at one joules per um, centimeter squared and using a spot size of four millimeters. However, if we, I do a double pulse, so that's two hertz. So we achieve a uniform blanching and leukotrichia with using the same parameters. So I expect a better clearance of the pigmented lesions. However, some of the patients, especially, especially the elderly, they present with both freckles and solar Lentigenes. So we're not supposed to use a single fluence. We, we need to uh, use the correct uh, fluence depending on the pigmented lesions. And sometimes uh, dermoscopy is also a very uh, helpful uh, tool to distinguish between freckles and solar lentigos. So take this case, for example, 
of a 74 year old female who wanted to be beautiful. Um, so uh, there was blanching, but in elderly patients, I am very cautious. And no matter how cautious we may be uh, with, uh, with our settings, most of the elderly patients, they develop uh, hypopigmentation. And this is the most common question that is asked uh, when we deliver uh, lectures on uh, pigment lasers. So most elderly patients, they develop um, hypo uh, pigmentation immediately after the or two weeks after the procedure. And this is just to uh, show you dermoscopic images at baseline. So I was trying to avoid um, uniform blanching to um, just to avoid the complication or the side effect of hypopigmentation. But eventually, the patient developed hypopigmentation. But in some patients, they are happier with hypopigmentation than having the original lesion. Uh, having the original uh, brown macules. So the bottom line is we have to be cautious in our elderly patients. We have to be cautious because the epidermis is thinner already. The dermis is uh, has lost its collagen. So and some of the adnexal structures have uh, atrophied uh, already. And most of all, we have to uh, remember that the elderly patients, when the melanocytes are damaged, um, it has a very little tendency to recover, or very slow tendency to recover. For lip lentigo, for lip lentigo, the Q-switch and the AI is excellent. And previously, we used to refer these cases to surgeons for excision, but now just uh, two shots or double shots or a frequency of two hertz using the 5-2 nanometer wavelength with a fluence of 1.2 joule per centimeter, 3 to 4 millimeter spot size. The lip lentigo usually clears uh, after one uh, session. And this is a patient, this is my, one of my patients with complete disappearance of the lip lentigo one month after treatment. So what are the recommendations? You have to take note of this slide. So in skin phototype 4, and I'm referring to Asians, Latinos, and Middle Easterns. So remember that 5T2 is reserved for epidermal lesions. And we usually uh, use a fluence of 1 joules per centimeter squared for freckles, 1.5 to 2 joules per centimeter squared for junctional nevi, capitolae macules, and solar nevi. And usually, uh, we need to do a minimum of uh, two sessions. And follow-up is very necessary to evaluate PIH, and we have to exercise a more conservative approach in the elderly patient. And a constant reminder to all those uh, practitioners uh, who use the NDAG or the pigment lasers, we should always do a test shot because we will not, uh, we cannot predict what will happen next. So if you do a test shot, we wait for five to 10 minutes, and if there is no untoward reaction, such as blistering or severe um, erythema, then we should continue. We can continue with the procedures. For the dermal lesions, the pigment laser, uh, the nanosecond Q-switch and the egg is perfect for uh, eyebrow tattoos. So I used uh, uh, these settings, 1.2 joules per centimeter squared, three millimeters spot size. And the patient didn't actually want the entire tattoo to be removed. She only wanted uh, like, 80% lightening. And this was achieved after two sessions um, and after four months. So the interval is usually um, monthly. So these are some guidelines for tips on eyebrow tattoo uh, removal. And this is from experts. So for eyebrow tattoos, very mild blanching is desired. So it's best to start with a very low fluence of one. You will also notice a lighter change in color after the procedure. The appearance of purpura, so you have to be very careful because if there's purpura, this may result in patient uh, dissatisfaction. After the procedure, we should uh, apply an antibiotic and a steroid ointment uh, to control inflammation. Um, then we instruct the patient to apply to uh, follow up after uh, four weeks. 
So the Q-switch uh, lasers are the mainstay for the treatment of the nevus astrata. So in adults, and lightening of 70% or more in a majority of patients have been ob observed with like four or five times with the Q-switch and the uh, laser. And these are the recommended settings from the publications and from our colleagues uh, abroad. Um, so 6.5 to 7 joules per centimeter squared, but you always have to do a test shot because in some, in some patients, I need to increase the affluence to 8 or 8.5 joules per centimeter squared. The spot size is 4 millimeters and frequency of um, 5 hertz. For nevus of Ota in children, the setting is a little lower, so it's 6 to 6.5 joules uh, per centimeter squared. The spot size is 4. We do one pass with 10 to 20 percent overlap or 5 hertz, uh, several passes until uh, we reach our endpoint. And basically, our endpoint for nevus of Ota is not latching because we're using 1064 but Portura. And it is now recommended that we don't uh, do the procedure every month, but rather wait for six months because it takes about four to six months for pigment clearance um, by the macrophages. So this is just uh, one of my patients in which 25% lightening was observed with only one session, but I told the patient that she has to wait for six months you know, before her next uh, follow-up. So this is now the practice of most uh, laser experts. For the acquired type of nevus of Ota, this is not present at birth, but it has the same histopathology as the nevus of Ota with spindle-shaped melanocytes in the dermis. And when you see a case like this, you don't promise your patient that they will respond to topical skin lightening agents uh, or chemical peels, they will not respond at all. So they will only re respond to pigment lasers, uh, such as the Q-switch and the YAG. So this is uh, my patient with um, corresponding dermoscopic images. And initially, I saw very little lightening because I, I've been, uh, the patient has been following up every month. I've been doing the laser for uh, on a monthly basis. However, after seven sessions, the patient was happier. She noticed like 80% uh, lightening of the of the acquired nevus of water. And in this patient, I didn't use five hertz. Instead, I used just two hertz because I was only concentrating on the pigment, and I was trying to avoid normal skin. So. I used a very high fluence at 8.5 joules per, cent per, per centimeter squared. And I used the, this parameter because uh, I was only able to attain the endpoint using this uh, parameter. So 4 millimeter spot size and 2 hertz. The abdom or acquired bilateral nevus of auto like macros, uh, we see it among Asians mostly. So Filipinos, Chinese, Koreans, this is a very common differential diagnosis of melasma. And I think there was a time in the past that this was considered the dermal type of uh, melasma, which is actually not. No, this is uh, genetic and similar to nevus of Ota or acquired nevus of Ota, there will be no response at all to skin lightening agents or chemical peels because we're dealing with pigments and melanocytes not in the epidermis, but in the dermis. So this is the histopathology of abdomen. And this is just to illustrate the fact that we're dealing with spindle-shaped melanocytes in the, in the dermis. So we need to use the laser to reach these melanocytes. And because most of the melanocytes are uh, surrounding the, the blood vessels there, and then there is a high risk of post-inflammatory uh, hyperpigmentation if we use uh, very high uh, settings. So this is just one study by uh, Dr. Lee uh, involving 42 Korean patients with abnum. He used the following uh, parameters, fluence of 8 to 9.5 joules per centimeter squared, spot size of 3 millimeters every four weeks a monthly for 10 sessions. and the outcome of the study is that 66% showed excellent to good results. However, two patients developed post-laser hyperpigmentation, which was a 
side effects. So the conclusion of the study is that if you switch to nanosecond and the YAG is safe and effective in short interval or repetitive treatments. So the clinical endpoint for abdom is similar in mucus of Otta or acquired mucus of Otta, which is uh, purpura. And these are dermoscopic images just to show that the endpoint has been achieved in most of the patients using the parameters which are written uh, above, like 8.5, 4 millimeters, 2 hertz. And I noticed that in patients who have just developed their abdom recently, there is more response to treatment or there is a more rapid response to treatment instead of um, seeing 80% appearance after the 10 sessions, sessions, usually after three sessions, uh, we may see a 50% reduction in treatment patient already. So the younger the abnormal or the younger the mucus of OTA, they respond well to the few switch. They respond better to the few switch and the end. So this is uh, one of my patients. Initially, I wasn't confident that because the, the abnum the color of the abdomen is always is almost uh, brownish black already. However, after uh, six sessions at eight joules per centimeter squared, four millimeters, two hertz, there was already ninety percent reduction in pigmentation, and the patient was very happy because for the longest time she has been applying topical skin lightening agents, and there was no effect. As she observed, uh, no effect. So for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, the Q-switch and the YAG laser is excellent. So this is uh, a patient of mine with a post post uh, herpes zoster uh, hyperpigmentation and scarring, which improved um, significantly with the Q-switch and the YAG laser. And this is a patient, a younger patient who had a vehicular accident and wanted the pigmentation to disappear fast. So um, I used a triple combination cream of um, Arbitin, um, Flucinolone, and Retinol as a, as a topical cream. And at the same time, used the Q-switch and the YAG. The patient had two treatments with the following settings. And after two treatments, there was a very significant uh, lightening of the uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. A very important uh, thing to note in PIH is that because we're targeting melanin or melanin pigments in the dermis, that means we need to use 1064. And you have to remember this because there are a few times that I try 5 p 2 nanometers thinking that the pathology is in the uh, epidermis. But using 5 v 2 will result to more uh, injury and you will have uh, problems with your uh, patient. And for the clinical endpoints, always mild erythema only. Uh, avoid purpura, uh, avoid, avoid uh, purpura or severe um, or very prominent erythema. For hydroquinone induced acrinosis, this is a therapeutic option because we all know that there is no treatment for um, acrinosis. Clinically, it presents as brown macules, confetti like the pigmentation, and um, cavity like macules. So, if we see the histopathology, we see ochre colored pigments, which are very difficult to destroy uh, using, like, for example, chemical peel or using topical skin lighting agents. So, our only option is the pigment laser. So, I use the following parameters. Although I must say there is no complete appearance of the hydroquinone in, uh, induced acrinosis, but the patient has noticed, and I also noticed uh, significant improvement. So this was the patient two months post treatment for two sessions. This is the endpoint, which is blanching purpura and uh, leukotrichia. And this is the patient on the left. This is the patient baseline, and on the right is the patient two months post-treatment after two sessions. And after seven sessions, the patient was happy with like 30 to 40 percent reduction in uh, pigmentation. So now we now go, so we now go to melasma, which is one of the top, top five dermatological conditions in Asia. It involves mostly females and it represents a hypersensitivity reaction to UV radiation 
there is increased melanocytes and melanosomes, and most often you find melasma in Asian or brown skin. And these are the known um, pathophysiological uh, factors or triggers, sun exposure, pregnancy, reaction to cosmetics, genetics, um, and oral contraceptive pills. And these are figures from a chapter that I have written in a book on melasma. And this shows uh, increased uh, uh, melanocytes in the basal cell layer. Um, on electron microscopy, there's more mitochondria. There is increased ribosome, uh, ribosomal activity. We see an infiltrate, so there's inflammation involved. So that's probably why a melasma responds to uh, topical steroids in, uh, mixed with your uh, arbutin or uh, retinol. And now we recognize that there is always um, telangiectasia of uh, blood vessels. So most of the time the blood vessels are involved and in most patients there is already um, beginning solar elastosis. And if you use the melon A stain, this will highlight how robust or how strong the melanocytes are uh, with lots of uh, melanosomes. However, the goal now of the Q-switch and the YAG uh, laser, especially the, the method which we call laser toning, is not to kill the melanocytes. We have to deliver a sublethal dose, but uh, reduce the, the fluence. Um, but reduce the fluence, so we just decrease the level or the amount of melanosomes but we don't attempt to kill the melanocytes, otherwise we will develop um, hyperpigmentation. So for melasma, these, are, these have been um, uh, written in books that the use of lasers is not generally recommended. However, a lot of studies are going on uh, on pigment lasers and its application on melasma. The non-ablative lasers are preferable. Uh, because we have seen that if you do, do fractional lasers, there's often exacerbation of melasma. And of course, we have to tell our patients that a paradoxical darkening may occur after uh, laser treatments. So, so what's new? So most laser experts recommend uh, low fluence and repeated treatments. And this is a recommended uh, settings from Dr. Lee's uh, study. And again, the there is subcellular damage to the dermal vasculature because we're dealing also with a pathology of the blood vessels. And one of the side effects, which is actually a, a uh, very good rejuvenating effect, is that the subthreshold injury stimulates the production of uh, new and uh, more ro robust uh, collagen. So these are still the current recommendations for the use of the pigment lasers in melasma. So we deliver uh, low fluence, and it is recommended uh, that we do the procedure, for example, on a weekly basis or every two weeks until eight to 10 sessions. Uh, it is recommended also that we prescribe triple combination creams, or we prepare the, the skin prior to the laser treatments. One side effect we have to tell our patients that there might be a laser-induced depigmentation or rebound hyperpigmentation. So we should also avoid a permanent leukotrichia. So we should avoid very frequent sessions or uh, more than 10 sessions. So these are just some examples of uh, cases of melasma. I usually use the q switch and the YAG for recalcitrant cases. Those Patients who have given up on topical skin lightening agent, those who have given up on chemical peels. So these are some patients with the corresponding uh, dermoscopic images and the documented decrease in the melanocyte uh, index. And these are the settings that uh, I used. So what's new? So everyone's talking about, uh, worldwide, everyone's talking about uh, tranexamic acid, the use of tranexamic acid, uh, I'm referring more to the uh, systemic uh, preparation, the oral capsule at 250 milligrams per capsule BID. 
There has been a study already which was published in the Blue Journal involving uh, 561 Asian patients and 89.7 improved in terms of the melanocyte uh, index. There is no study yet, uh, published study yet, on the use of topical phenytoic acid in combination with the um, pigment laser, but uh, this is also uh, very promising. So most laser experts have started prescribing phenytoic acid uh, prior two weeks prior and two weeks after uh, a Q-switch and the ad session, they combined it, they, they, it is usually combined with a procedure called laser toning, which I will explain uh, later on. So these are some side effects of tranexamic acid, but in some patients, who, in some of my patients who have taken tranexamic acid, uh, there was no report of this uh, side effect. So the tranexamic acid can be com combined with uh, laser toning using the Q-Swish and the YAG and your triple combination creams. So these are the settings of uh, laser toning. It's usually uh, PTP off, uh, which is a photo toning uh, pulse of the uh, laser, of the tri -beam laser. Spot size of five to six, fluence of 1.2 to two joules per centimeter squared, frequency of 6 to 10 hertz, and laser toning is done every two weeks until uh, you reach 10 sessions. But from the recent Salsa meeting in Incheon in Korea, our colleagues and experts, uh, Dr. Unshul Yo and uh, Dr. Vivek Mehta, recommended uh, the use of, uh, Dr. Vivek Mehta actually is experienced with uh, prescribing tranexamic acid and combining it with laser toning. However, Dr. Unchul Yo recommended the following settings uh, using the fractional handpiece, PTP off, with the following parameters 300 shots per area or per side of the melasma every two weeks for 10 sessions. And since then, I have been using either laser toning or the fractional handpiece on my melasma patients and I have been getting very good results. So take this case for example of uh, one of my patients, a 53 year old female who have given up on topicals because she have used um, Arbutin cream for quite some time and several chemical peels. But she has, uh, she had a recent rebound of uh, a very bad melasma so I gave her tranexamic, I gave her topic, just topical vitamin C and um, oral tranexamic acid, 250 milligrams capsule twice a day, two weeks before the laser session and two weeks after the laser session. So these are just some photos at baseline and after the first session, this was the patient after the second session. So I used laser toning during the first session, but after the salsa meeting, I shifted to the recommendations by uh, Dr. Yo. Um, and this was the patient after the second session. This was the patient after the third session. And we see a almost an 80% reduction in pigmentation and the patient was actually happy. And this is validated by a marked uh, or a significant in decrease in melanocyte index and improvements in uh, dermoscopic features. So what are the other clinical and aesthetic applications of the NDIAG laser? In Japan, they are using the nanosecond Q-switch NDIAG for non-ablative skin rejuvenation using the following settings. I have tried it on a few patients uh, only, but Dr. Ito in Japan has a very wide experience. And also for infraorbital uh, hyperpigmentation, even the books say that the pigment lasers um, has been shown to improve the appearance of infraorbital uh, hyperpigmentation. So these are just some recommendations based on uh, the two uh, SALSA meetings. This is the Association of Laser Surgeons in um, Asia. Um, uh, we need, I think we need to do physician and patient satisfaction surveys in those uh, physicians who are using the Q-switch and the YAG and in the patients who have used the Q-switch and the YAG for pigmented lesions. 
there should be a comparison of the nanosecond versus the picosecond uh, laser uh, on its effect on the pigmentation. I'm not in the position to talk about uh, the picosecond laser because it's beyond the scope of my lecture. And you should also conduct a study comparing the Q-switch and the AG versus the Alexandra laser. And we have to note that the effects or the results of the study in pigmented skin or in Asian skin may, di may, may differ from the results of the study done in Caucasian skin or in type 2 or type 3 uh, skin type. So we should uh, do a, a, a study um, uh, on uh, pigmented uh, skin or on brown skin. And it is recommended that uh, we should uh, do biopsies, we should do mixometer uh, readings, and it has to be dermoscopy assisted uh, to evaluate the clinical response of preventive lesions to the fusion and the And of course, other applications uh, on other causes of hyperpigmentation in Asian skin, such as lichen planus pigmentosus, real melanosis, and minocycline induced uh, pigmentation. I have started already. Uh, you, I have started using the Q-Swish and the YAG uh, in some of my patients who have LPP, uh, real melanosis, and uh, drug-induced pigmentation. And probably in the next SALSA meeting or in other conferences in which I have a lecture, I will be able to show you the results of the preliminary study. So special precautions. In some patients, don't be scared if you see Orticaria or wheels immediately after the procedure. This is called pressure orticaria. It resolves in like three to four hours. If your uh, patient is um, worried, then you may give uh, topical steroids. Blistering is definitely undesirable. If you have blistering, then probably you will have a scar. So you, we have to avoid very high settings. And of course, the complications are hyperpigmentation. And as I told you earlier, if we're dealing with um, elderly patients, hypopigmentation, there is high risk of developing hypopigmentation. So we have to be very careful. And of course, we have to protect our eyes and our patients' uh, eyes. When we do the procedure, the hand piece should be, uh, it should be directed away from the orbital rim all the time. And uh, if you want to know more about the last mind in LIGO in brown skin, I co-authored a, a, a chapter on the histopathology of melasma and the differential diagnosis. The editors-in-chief edi editors are my uh, colleagues, Evangeline Handog and uh, Juliet Makarai. So what are the take-home messages? So don't believe everything that you read or hear or what you read from the promotional materials of most of the pigment lasers. We should master the basic principles on the proper use of the pigment lasers. And all procedures, I recommend that it has to be uh, supervised by a uh, trained uh, dermatologist or a plastic surgeon or a physician. We should continue to gather evidence from peer-reviewed journals because, until, uh, because uh, at, this, at this point in time, uh, there is um, uh, very, very few studies are done, ha have been done, especially control trials have been done on the Q-switch and the AG laser. Don't hesitate to ask expert colleagues, especially uh, in terms of experience. So there are a lot of experts in Korea, in Singapore, and in Europe. So we should consult them if we have uh, uh, concerns or problems. We, o we counsel patients on what to expect. We don't... Uh, we don't give them like false expectations or false promises. So we should be able to give them like reasonable expectations only. And of course, we should try as physicians to deliver maximum efficacy and uh, safety. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, we say maraming salamat in, uh, in the Philippines. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Terry, and thank you. thank you. It's always great to see your beautiful lectures and a very useful, a lot of information.
to appreciate about it. So during your lecture, we've got several questions from Dr. Right. Aditi Sain. Sina, Sina, Sain. So the first question was, can you combine chemical peels and lasers during the treatment of melasma? Or is it advisable to start with pills and switch to lasers thereafter? Or definitely in the management of melasma, uh, it is recommended that we do a like a combination of uh, procedures. So, for example, in some of my patients, I use the few switch uh, and the yag. Uh, if uh, I don't like to do it every two weeks, I do it on a monthly basis, and in between. I uh, uh, do clinical peels, and based on uh, evidence-based studies, it's seventy percent glycolic acid, which has a fairly high evidence um, as a chemical peeling agent in uh, in melasma. We can also use uh, TCA or the other um, combination peels. So you can. Uh, do your laser every month and do the chemical peels uh, in between. Yeah. Uh -huh. But make sure that after after doing your chemical peel, you have to wait for like three weeks because that's the time when the newer skin has regenerated already. Uh -huh. Thank you. And has recovered from the injury. Yeah. Uh -huh. I see. Thank you. And the next question is, how will you treat periorbital hyperpigmentation in a patient with normal blood parameters? Thyroid function? Uh, oh, with nor with the uh, switch and the yeah, laser, you know? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so if you see, if you open the question panel over there, and you can see clearly, but yeah. uh, it's also from same doctor. And so how, how would periorbital hyperpigmentation? Peri actually, periorbital hyperpigmentation is not uh, very common among Filipinos. However, in Indians, it is one of the more common complaints. Um, when the patients, when uh, among patients with like type four or type five uh, pigmented skin, uh, I learned from our colleague Dr. Divik Mehta that. He uses the laser toning parameters as well for periorbital hyperpigmentation. And I have seen his uh, um, his like collection of patients uh, with periorbital hyperpigmentation before and after photos. Most uh, of the patients responded well to treatment. Uh -huh. I see. Yeah, but so, make sure that when you treat uh, the periorbital area, the hand feet should be diverted away uh, from the um, periorbital rim. That is it. Okay. Yeah. And the other request was uh, they ask you to explain uh, again about the uh, laser tonings. Also, the laser toning. Uh, if you notice the fluid very low, so it's from so we use the 1064, and then it is recommended that you don't use the, the PTP or the total toning pulse. So it should be PTP off, and uh, we use 10 hertz and we use several uh, passes, and we don't expect uh, marked erythema after the our procedure. And the, immediately after the procedure, you will notice a like a rejuvenating effect, similar to after delivering like radio frequency or um, IPL. The advantage of laser toning is that we deliver a lower fluence, so we don't really uh, intend to damage the melanocytes. We tend to decrease the amount of melanosomes or the we tend to decrease the number of melanosomes at the same time delivering substantial injury to the dermis. So this will also stimulate uh, collagen production and it will also address the pathology uh, of the dilated and the abnormal uh, blood vessels. So it's basically uh, low fluence 
with uh, using many many passes or uh, we usually use ten hertz. Ah, so low Florence, but multiple passes is quite uh, it's important. Which means it sounds yeah. like to me to be careful when you're using particular like lasers and don't yeah. be rushed to see uh, the dramatic results in in a few just a few sessions. So you need to when we need to be patient to see the good result. Am I understanding correctly? Yeah, and in addition, uh, actually laser toning is now the most commonly uh, used uh, like settings or parameters of the fuse switch and the indicator. Because it does it does not only treat the pigmentation, it also stimulates collagen production. So it uh, delivers a rejuvenating uh, uh, effect better than the other lasers. Yeah. I see. So there is a uh, another question from Ruby Hari Uno. Oh Ruby Hari Uno. Oh no. And the question is: Can we use hydroquinone for melasma? How long we treat melasma with hydroquinone? How do you think? Actually, if uh, we evaluate um, studies or uh, publications, there has been a um, systematic review or a meta-analysis uh, done already on all skin lighting agents. So 4% uh, hydroquinone is no longer recommended, although it's still the gold standard. But what is more recommended is the combination of hydroquinone plus uh, succinolone and um, and retinol. The well, what this is what we call as a triple combination cream, and it has a fairly uh, it is a very good uh, uh, evidence based on uh, studies that have been reviewed. I, I mean studies that are randomized and uh, which are basically randomized control trials. So, in some countries, the use of hydroquinone has already been banned uh, because of the side effect of um, hydroquinone acrinosis. So, if I were you, I would rather use the triple combination cream containing hydroquinone, uh, fusinolone, and retinol rather than use a pure hydroquinone for the first time. Just to avoid complication. Yeah. Just, just but there, yeah. yeah, but there are other alternative skin lightening agents now which have fairly evident which have fairly good evidence like azelaic acid, glycolic acid, uh tretinoin. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now it seems like there is a several questions about the uh, periorbital area. So uh, the dogs Suckles. Optimization of Q switch on under eye dark circles. What do you think? Yeah, dark circles. As I told you earlier, uh, uh, I have very limited experience in periorbital hyperpigmentation because it is not common among Filipinos. I think in Koreans also they are not uh, very common. This is the basically uh, one of the main problems among Indian. Uh, uh -huh. patient. And in one of the slides, I showed you uh, the basic parameters that's yes. being used. And that's basically similar to the laser toning parameters. Okay. Then oh, this will be, this may perhaps quite many audience will, would want to know. How do you protect the eyes when treating periodontal hyperpigmentation? Uh, we can use a um, lens cover, but we have to uh, ask the uh, the help of the ophthalmologist to teach us how to how to use it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. There is actually an eye. There, there is actually a special eye cover in which you have to apply um, uh, anesthetic eye drops first before inserting it into the into the eyes. Yeah. Okay, and uh, this one is done. This one is done. That is a quite uh, quite interesting question also. Mm, one more question, Dr. Have you used the 585 nanometer per dye handpiece for the peri, what, what it is? I can't see it. 
Four twines? Four twines or other vascular treatments? Yeah, 585 so, nanometer. 585. Yeah, 585 nanometer is uh, very good for uh, vascular for vascular lesions. Yeah, what was the question again? If I use it for periorbital hyperpigmentation or for twine? No, no, no. It's only it's a uh, it's a different one. It's a, about a diehard piece. Five eight five. Of the tribeam, you mean? I think so. Because yeah, because we don't have the we don't have the uh, yeah we don't have the pulse dilator attachment. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on. Let's move on. But the, uh, the pulse light laser is still the gold standard for the treatment of port wine stains. Okay. Yeah. And the other question is, uh, I have some cases using NDI laser 532 five for three freckles. Two. But for it's freckles. in me, it's for freckles. But after a month, months. yes, but after a month, the freckle become hyperpigmentation. Hyperpigmentation. Yeah, yeah. hyperpigmentation. Uh, yeah, I also have some experience. Uh, I've been getting hyperpigmentation after treating freckles or uh, sodium antigen, but I but not with the machine, but 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 not with the tribeam. Yeah, but not with the tribeam. I have used some uh, other uh, pigment lasers. With uh -huh. a stronger fluence, with, with uh -huh. the, which delivers uh, higher energy, and one of the side effects is uh, hyperpigmentation. But I have not encountered any hyperpigmentation from the treatment of freckles using the tribeam. Perhaps this is more compatible with Asian skin or pigmented skin. Ah, uh -huh. I see. So, um. It seems like it seems like a little like an hour now. But my last question is: We, we talk about we talk about quite a lot about hyperpigmentation. Then I'd like to ask you: Could you please share your experience about hyperpigmentation cases? Hyperpigmentation, yeah. From my slides, it was highlighted that I noticed that in my practice, most of the elderly patients, especially those who are 60 years old and above. They are very prone to develop hypopigmentation, basically because the epidermis is thin, the dermis has lesser collagen, and there is very little um, potential for the melanocyte to recover immediately after the after the injury. That is why I am using the dermoscope a lot. Uh, before I deliver the pulses of the fuse switch and the in elderly patients. Because if we achieve um, uniform blanching on, for example, freckles or um, solar lentigene, then most likely the patient will develop hypopigmentation. And if the patient is old already, most likely the melanocyte will not recover anymore after the injury. So that's like a persistent uh, side effect. Yeah, so we have to be very careful with elderly individuals. But for younger patients, I noticed that very that few of them uh, develop high pigmentation. Unless, of course, that we are very aggressive with our parameters and we are using like very uh, high fluids. I see. Thank you very much. So high pigmentation mostly in the elderly. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So. Thank you. I think we have run quite through all the questions, but if you do not have uh, if you have further questions, just let don't please don't hesitate to let us know or let me know and I will make sure if you email me, I will make sure do you have uh, received solve your questions. So Yeah, and I'll be able to answer it through email also. Yes, 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 exactly. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, time to be done for now. Again, yeah. Dr. Derry, thank you for your lecture tonight. And oh, everyone, please. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And every the attendees, two attendees, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. And our thank next, you. yeah, thank you. Our next webinar is going to about lipo cell or ultra cell. There is a new uh, newly published articles here. So we are going to let you know through all the emails 
which you have uh, have recorded to us as well. Thank you tonight. See you later. See you next month. Bye. Bye. Bye.